I met Ron. Ron uh, was a judge at Lancapex many years ago. We met and chatted a bit, and uh, he and I were on a committee for APS Education Committee for several years when they were looking into a certification process. But um, I've gotten to know Ron through his writings, uh, even though I'm a, I wasn't a revenue collector. I'm still just a, a newbie in this. Um, I'm a real stamp magazine junkie. And I really enjoy uh, Ron's articles on, on the revenues uh, because, because they're interesting. They're, they're great stories. And I think tonight is, is going to be a good one. Um, you'll see uh, his writings in stamp, American Stamp Dealer and Collector in Lens, uh, in some of the, 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 the just revenue journals, uh, so they're all over and one's better than the other. So we're always glad to, to have you. So Ron, uh, without further ado, you, uh, you're you gonna advance your own slides. And, I am. And, and we have them as backup. And do you want questions during or after? Absolute, absolutely. Anytime, very good. Okay, sir, you're on. I should add one more thing. I grew up in Effort of Pennsylvania. Very good. Uh, let's see. One more click and all right, let's get back to the beginning here. Okay, <clears throat> my talk tonight began with an exhibit that eventually got up to 10 frames. One of those frames was three dimensional objects. Uh, I first made this uh, a similar presentation about 10 years ago over in Delaware. And the current presentation is now in three parts and you're going to be hearing part two. Part one is the lead up to national prohibition. Part three is the aftermath, the brief period in 1933 when they changed the definition of intoxicating beverage. What we should first start with is the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment, I'm going to read part one, section one of that amendment. After one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States and all the territories subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. Um, <clears throat> they intentionally did not define intoxicating beverage in the amendment itself. Um, by January 15th, 1919, 33 states had ratified this amendment and it took effect January 16th, 1920. By the early years of national prohibition, a total of 44 states had ratified this amendment. Two never did, they rejected it. Connecticut and Rhode Island. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, one other thing, the Volstead Act. Intentionally, they had not defined intoxicating beverage in the amendment because they thought that was subject to challenge and they didn't want the amendment challenged. They could certainly challenge a law. It became known as the Volstead Act because of the person who proposed it. And the definition in the Volstead Act of intoxicating beverage is one half of 1% alcohol. So let's look at some objects, not necessarily revenues. We're gonna see a number of objects tonight that are, are not revenues. Here's a label from Schaefer's uh, Malt Tonic, and you'll see across the bottom that it says, does not contain a half of 1% alcohol by volume. Uh, many of the breweries attempted to survive in prohibition by producing these malt tonics, uh, not limited to, again, a half of 1% alcohol. Generally speaking, they were 
not considered very favorable, favorably by the public. Uh, and many, many breweries went out of business during the years of prohibition. <clears throat> now, there was one other thing that could be uh, marketed during prohibition. They were called malt extracts. These could contain up to 3.76% alcohol, but they also had to contain 18% solids. And my comment about this, uh, you'll recognize the brewery, Pepps Corporation of Milwaukee. Uh, I'm not so sure this would have been a wonderful drink, but maybe uh, with 18% solids, it might have been a, a wonderful chew, I suppose. It, it was, it, again, it was not an exceedingly popular uh, uh, product in the, during the prohibition years, but it was again an attempt by the breweries to market things that they hoped would keep them in business during national prohibition. The state of New York thought that if they taxed it, they could still sell alcohol. And here is one of the stamps that was issued. This was for something that was coming from outside the state. It's a rather large stamp. It was to be placed on the bottle. Um, uh, the, there are black ones that are similar to this that would have been placed on containers. New York, in fact, tried to get the breweries to, to uh, continue it, uh, producing full strength beer during these years. Uh, it was eventually challenged in court, and in May 1921, the courts ruled otherwise, and this law uh, was, was in fact uh, struck down. But during, during, up until May of 1921, over a year into national prohibition, um, it was legal, and I've got used examples of this in my collection, uh, in which... Uh, they could uh, supposedly market uh, beverage alcohol. Uh, now, the state of Michigan in the late 1920s decided that there were a lot of people who were beginning to brew home uh, beer, beer at home, which was perfectly legal. Uh, for their own use, uh, but uh, uh, they decided to, talk, to tax malt. And these are uh, one of the ingredients for, for making home brews. Uh, these are two slightly different examples from 1929 and 1930. Uh, the, the tax on malt and wort as uh, the liquid i uh, give you a couple of, another example of this. I am, happen to be very proud of this. This is a face value of $10 and it's a pair. And yes, I know it's got a hole in it and it's got damage up there in the center top, but uh, uh, find, me, uh, find, find me another uh, used example of the $10, much less a pair. Uh, $20 uh, of tax on uh, malt or wort, uh, I, I believe I calculated given the rates that this would have represented the tax on 400 pounds of, of malt. And so this certainly is not for, uh, I can't imagine a home brewer ever purchasing 400 pounds of malt. Uh, so this was an attempt. At, Michigan was not the only state that did this. Certainly, Arkansas was another state that taxed malt. They did not want people producing beer even in the home, even though technically it was legal. Now, I should say something about Pennsylvania, my native state, and where most of you reside. Um, at the beginning of Prohibition, uh, Pennsylvania had a, uh, a wet governor and he said, we are not going to enforce national prohibition. And I have two, uh, three, as a matter of fact, three licenses issued by 
the clerk of courts of uh, neighboring Berks County to a tavern to sell um, uh, malt beverages and liquor. And I, when I first uh, discovered this, uh, I said, how could that possibly be? Well, the governor said, the state police are, are uh, uh, we don't have time to hire, we don't have the money to hire additional state police. Therefore, if the federal government wishes to enforce prohibition in Pennsylvania, they're certainly welcome to do so, but we are not going to enforce it. And so Berks County at least, and, and I suspect many other counties, uh, continued to uh, issue licenses for the sale of intoxicating beverages for the first couple of years of prohibition. And then Pennsylvania elected a dry governor. And uh, a name that you probably will recognize, Gifford Pinchot. And he convinced uh, the state legislature to ratify the 18th Amendment, making it illegal for intoxicating beverages to be manufactured and sold in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, but the, when he submitted his budget to the legislature, the legislature eliminated the additional uh, funds for hiring people to enforce prohibition in Pennsylvania. So Pincho went to the Women's Christian Temperance Union and convinced them to supply the state of Pennsylvania with uh, funds to hire people to enforce national prohibition. Uh, can you imagine somebody going into, uh, an agent going into a uh, tavern, a bar, and uh, well, there certainly were ladies of the night there, and uh, he's gotten into court, taking these people to court for violating the prohibition amendment, and the defense attorney saying, uh, just how many, uh, just how many uh, beers did you order when you were there at the tavern? Uh, would they have clouded your memory of what was going on there at the time? And that caused, when, when that happened, the Women's Christian Temperance Union decided that they were going to withdraw the funds from Pennsylvania because they weren't being used in the way that they had hoped that they would be used. They didn't like the idea that the agents themselves were in fact purchasing intoxicating beverages in order to collect evidence of the violation of the National Prohibition Act. Okay, how can you get legal, pro legal alcohol during prohibition? Here is an example of a prescription blank filled out by a physician for spiritus frumenti, otherwise known as whiskey. And I want you to notice these were, uh, these were printed by the government, supplied to the physicians and take the people could take them to the pharmacy to be filled. This one happens to be filled in, in St. Louis, Missouri. But I want you to look at, uh, sort of slightly above the middle. And one of the, one of the things that needs to be filled out is his street and number. They wanted the address of the individual for whom this prescription was being written. His street and number. It, the assumption was that medicinal alcohol would only be prescribed to men, not women. We recall that this was just after the adoption of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Uh, this is a blotter that I have acquired uh, from the American Medicinal Spirits Company. You will see examples of uh, their products, um, including the stamps on the bottles that were used. Uh, uh, medicinal spirits, old rosebud and bourbon deluxe. Um, and uh, they were a very successful company during the prohibition era, supplying our pharmacies with medicinal alcohol. Here's an example of some of the vast 
paperwork that was uh, uh, introduced during Prohibition. This is uh, uh, one of the pages from Widmer's Wine Cellars up in Naples, New York, in the in the uh, uh, wine area, growing area in uh, in uh, New York, and uh, it's uh, sending sherry wine down to Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, you could also prescribe uh, uh, wines uh, as a medicinal spirit. This is uh, the second page of that. Uh, again, lots and lots of uh, um, uh, lots and lots of paperwork to document the legal uh, purchase of of uh, distilled spirits and wine during prohibition. Uh, here's a prescription for sherry. Again, this is from the beginning of Prohibition. This is 1922. Uh, uh, this is in California. <clears throat> I bet most of you didn't realize the wonderful medicinal uh, qualities of sherry. As if the federal paperwork was not enough, in the state of Texas, the physician had to not only fill out the federal prescription blank, but they also had to fill out the state blank as well. And so both of these went off to the, uh, to the pharmacy to be filled. Uh, again, this one says whiskey, uh, tablespoon as, as prescribed, as directed. Um, uh, again, uh, this is uh, actually the third of the prescription blanks that were used during prohibition. Here is a counterfeit prescription blank from Brooklyn. Uh, physicians could get these books with the prescription blanks printed by the government. This, uh, uh, the one in the previous slide was actually printed by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Uh, physicians were limited as to how many prescriptions they could use per month. And if they tried to write more prescriptions than that, um, they had to wait until the time was up and then acquire another book of 100 prescriptions. And so I was very fortunate in finding a small group of counterfeit prescription blanks from Brooklyn like this, also a different... Uh, um, one with prefix B on it that was used earlier than this one. Uh, they were all filled in the same pharmacy. So again, these would have wound up in a pharmacy and they were rescued from that pharmacy. Uh, as many as uh, I believe eight or nine different physicians were writing prescriptions on counterfeit uh, prescription, uh, uh, on, on these counterfeit prescription blanks uh, this, this pharmacy must have had quite a business in supplying alcohol to the thirsty uh, people of Brooklyn. Oh, wait a minute. Not thirsty. They were ill and they needed these spirits in order to recover their health. Uh, this is a, a delightful official specimen. Uh, the, again, this was produced by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing almost certainly would have been produced in order to enter into evidence in a court trial. Uh, I have never seen one that had, had actually been used that way, but this is almost certainly, given the number of uh, specimens that we know exist, uh, this, this must have been the, the, the most likely use for these uh, specimens. Now here's a, a late, uh, uh, this is from, 1930. This is a prescription of, for gin. Uh, I, I jokingly suggest that this was no doubt for adding to quinine water for a patient with malaria. It was, it was uh, uh, written in Sacramento, California. Uh, it also is inscribed with the Bureau of Prohibition on the left. Uh, this was a uh, uh, a change in organizations in, in Washington uh, that took place about 1926. 
uh, and they had to change the prescription blanks because it was no longer out of internal revenue. Uh, but I, 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 gin, a wonderful medicinal spirit, right? Here's another one. This one is again filled at the same pharmacy in Sacramento, California. And this is for rum, another wonderful medicinal spirit. Uh, can you imagine what the storeroom in this uh, uh, pharmacy in Sacramento must have been like? It had gin, rum, certainly had to have whiskey. Who knows what all they had in that storeroom in that pharmacy in Sacramento, California. This one is not from the same pharmacy, but this is for brandy. Oh, not just any brandy. This is for French brandy. This is from November of 1933. This is within a month of the end of national prohibition. <coughs> By this time, it was possible to, to import uh, such things as French brandy uh, for medicinal purposes. And it is, again, another reorganization at the federal level. This is from uh, the, the, the people who were in charge of enforcing prohibition at this point are, were called the Bureau of Industrial Alcohol. Another acquisition uh, that I made rather recently and during 1933, after, after uh, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was uh, uh, installed, uh, inaugurated as, as our president, uh, he had run on, on a, uh, one of the planks in his platform was to, was to legal, to change, uh, initially to change the definition of intoxicating beverages and also to uh, uh, repeal the 18th Amendment. But in, in this period of time, it was also possible to prescribe more than a pint. Uh, up, until, up until this time, up until early 1933, uh, the maximum amount that one could uh, prescribe and fill at a uh, pharmacy was a pint. And that had to last at least a month. Uh, I've been, I've been looking for prescriptions for the same person that were filled illegally more frequently than that. I have, have yet to find that, even though I have found some prescription uh, books uh, with the stubs in them filled out for a single physician, and uh, even in Chicago. And, and to date, I have not found any violations by physicians uh, other than those uh, ones that were obviously prescribing a lot of uh, whiskey in Brooklyn and, and had to uh, resort to uh, uh, counterfeit uh, uh, prescription blanks. Okay, so that's the story of, of, of prescription alcohol, medicinal alcohol. Was that the only way to obtain uh, alcohol during prohibition, the only legal way? And the answer to that was no. This is an application to procure wine for sacramental purposes. Again, from Widmer's uh, Wine Cellars in uh, Naples, New York. Uh, I was very fortunate in a visit to uh, uh, Widmer's uh, uh, about two years ago. Uh, uh, the original family that had owned Widmer's uh, had, uh, when, when the last surviving members of that family uh, died, in her will, she said that all the paperwork uh, relating to Widmer's was to be destroyed. And in fact, very uh, labels and, and everything from before that date uh, were destroyed, except that the person that I talked to said, wait a minute, if, I think if we go over there to uh, the next building, I think up in, the, up in the attic, if you're willing to climb up there, I think I found something that uh, evaded being uh, uh, destroyed at that time. And uh, I was able to acquire from her a number of these applications to procure wine for sacramental purposes and also the similar ones for uh, 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 shipping uh, 
uh, wine for medicinal purposes that you saw earlier in my presentation. Uh, again, these, these do not seem to be very common. Wine for sacramental purposes, here's a tag from the Italian Vineyard Company. They have a permit for supplying. Uh, this is written uh, in 1924 to the Reverend Charles Murphy of San Diego, California. And if we flip the, over the back of this tag, there would be 40 cents in tax stamps, enough for a gallon of sweet wine. And again, churches and synagogues needed to have a government purchase a permit to in order to purchase. And also the supplier also needed the permit, which we, we saw on the previous slide. Now, one of the, one of the prizes of my collection is, is this, this example. It is called a book wine stamp. You see it has a, a tablet attached to the stamp itself, the $20 stamp. Uh, this was for the attaching of additional stamps to make up a rate for a, a barrel of 50 and a half gallons of altar wine. Uh, nice uh, bold cancellation, handwritten calculation or uh, cancellation. And this is from the novitiate of Los Gatos in, in California. And they were uh, uh, a, a supplier of altar wines and they, and the way they supplied it, they didn't bottle it. They, they supplied uh, uh, barrels uh, of, uh, of wine to, uh, to churches and, and potentially synagogues as well. Uh, one of the stories that I have re I've seen uh, describing the history of wine during prohibition was that there were people who went to phone books, picked out as many of the Jewish sounding names and applied for a, uh, a permit in order to, to uh, acquire sacramental wine to be distributed during the High Holy Days to their synagogue, which consisted of the people that were listed on the, uh, on the application. <coughs> Here's another example. This one again from the state of California uh, the tax rates had declined and uh, uh, it has a 20 cent stamp on the reverse. And this was almost certainly for uh, five gallons uh, of, of what we would today call a light wine uh, that is under 14%. In 1926, the tax rates on both alcohol and on wine, uh, distilled spirits and wine were, were, uh, were reduced. Now, in order for a pharmacy to fill prescriptions, they had to have a what is called a special tax stamp. Uh, this, in essence, is they paid twenty-five dollars to the uh, to the Internal Revenue. This one has some coupons at the top. This was only for six months, so it was prorated to twelve dollars and fifty cents. And this was a pharmacy in New York City. Uh, that was filling prescriptions for medicinal alcohol. Uh, a great pursuit to try and find uh, retail liquor dealers special tax stamps for every year during Prohibition. They're avidly sought after. After Prohibition ends, these are very, very common uh, uh, special tax stamps uh, that we see. They, were, they looked like this from 1920 until 1953, after which they went to uh, computer-generated uh, uh, special tax stamps. Uh, I believe these were eliminated, uh, these uh, special taxes on certain occupations uh, were eliminated during the, the, uh, the second Bush administration here in the 21st century. Some of us are old enough to remember that uh, there were federal stamps that crossed the top of our uh, bottles of whiskey and such. This happens to be for a bottled and bond distilled spirits. It is, again, uh, this was bottled at 100 proof. In other words, it's 50% alcohol. This was for a quart. 
Uh, they've altered the dates. It's bottled in the spring of 1920. So this would have been uh, bottled during uh, uh, a prohibition. Uh, I suspect that if this was, and, and, I, and it was used, I suspect that this, if this went to a pharmacy, they, uh, they had to rebottle it in the pharmacy if they were to, they couldn't fill a prescription for more than uh, for a pint. <coughs> the reason for bottling and bond, these stamps came into use in 1897. Prior to 1897, most uh, whiskey was shipped out of, uh, out of the distilleries uh, to wholesale liquor dealers in barrels and uh, it was bottled locally. But in 1897, uh, the distilleries had uh, uh, reached out to Congress and allowed them to bottle it in the bonded warehouse and keep it there for a maximum of eight years without having to pay the tax. When it left the bonded warehouse, the tax had to be paid. Ah, uh, yes, the moonshiners. This is a counterfeit green strip stamp that would have been used for 100 proof alcohol. It is, uh, uh, you will see the, the bottle label for Melvale's Pure Rye Whiskey. I want you to note the spelling on the bottle label of Melvale, M-E-L, one L there, V-A-L-E. And now if we look at the green strip stamp that was to be placed over the top, take a look at how Melvale is spelled there. It's M-E-L-L-V-A-L-E. -L -L -E. So which was it? Was it with one L there or two Ls? I don't know. But this was put on in order to, to convince the potential customer that you're getting good pure rye whiskey from this uh, Maryland distiller. The name of the game for the moonshiners is how can we fill, fool the consumer? This is an export bottled and bond stamp and it's a forgery, it, again, a counterfeit. Um, it, uh, it's trying to tell the consumer, we really care about you. We smuggled this, it had been exported prior to prohibition and we brought it back just for you. This is good whiskey smuggled back into the United States. <coughs> the problem is that the genuine stamp would have been engraved and this is not an engraved stamp. And in fact, it's a crude imitation. The distillers, at least in the early years of prohibition, really wanted to market their distilled spirits, which they had made before the beginning of prohibition. They had warehouses filled with whiskey. And so they said, the smallest, uh, the, the smallest that was permitted during prohibition was a half pint or a pint. Now, most people, who went to their physician to get a prescription for medicinal alcohol, did they want a half pint or did they want a pint? They wanted a pint. <clears throat> Although I believe there are some states that only permitted by state law that the prescriptions could be only as much as a half pint, but the half pint stamps are rather scarce. The distillers went to, to the government and said, look, how about if we allow quarter pints, that's four ounces, almost miniatures, a little bit larger than a miniature. Uh, we'd like that because we can market it to physicians and that way the physician, and I remember this when I was very young, uh, frequently uh, if I was getting a prescription, the physician would give me the beginnings of that prescription uh, as I left his, his or her office, and before I got my prescription filled at the local pharmacy, I could be on my way to, to, to recovery because I had the prescription. So this was marketed to physicians 
so that they could give out these things, the quarter pints, to their to their uh, 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 people, uh, and so they could be on the road to recovery even before they got to the pharmacy to fill their prescription for a pint of medicinal alcohol. In 1926, they changed. These are much wider strips than, than, than I ever remember seeing. These were used from about 1926 till 1930, beginning of uh, the, the first half of 1933. And again, these uh, came about at the, at the same time as the uh, enforcement was uh, given to the newly created Bureau of Prohibition. And again, you can find these in quarter pints, half pints, and pints. The pints are relatively common. Uh, I must have 20, 25 of these from different uh, distilleries. Uh, I think I've only got two or three half pints and probably maybe one or two more than that of the quarter pints. Uh, everybody wanted as much alcohol as they could get from, from their prescription. Uh, the cases of alcohol that were distributed uh, had serial numbers on them, beginning with uh, uh, this uh, series of 1926. You see that red serial number down in the middle at the bottom. That same, that same uh, serial number was on the every one of the uh, green strip stamps that were in the bottles in that. And this was for a case of uh, three proof gallons uh, and that consisted of 24 bottles. So uh, that was uh, for, a, for a case of, uh, of pints. Non-beverage alcohol was also taxed during this period. This is for industrial alcohol. <coughs> the underlying stamp without the overprint was, was first issued in 1910. And this would have been used on industrial alcohol, almost certainly 190 proof. Uh, 200 proof would be pure alcohol. That's almost uh, unobtainable. Uh, but uh, uh, 190 proof was, was certainly uh, what uh, uh, industry wished to have, and this was for uh, 90 proof gallons. Uh, 90, if it was 190 proof, uh, uh, it, would, it, was, it was less than 90 gallons as we think of it. Uh, okay, uh, actually 98.8 counting the coupons at the top. Uh, this is uh, a, another non-beverage. You will see hand stamped in the center of the bottom of part of the stamp uh, that this was, uh, uh, this was placed on, uh, let's see, it's 9.5, it's five wine gallons, what we would know as five gallons. Uh, but it is 9.5. So this is 190 proof alcohol, five gallons of it, which contains nine, therefore 9.5 proof gallons, which is what determines the amount of tax that is being paid on this industrial alcohol. Many of the seizures, uh, uh, they, they simply dumped uh, the alcohol, dispose of it, it never got on. I suspect that uh, this was really good 190 proof alcohol. It was in somebody's wrong hands. Uh, and uh, uh, so they, uh, they probably auctioned it off and uh, whoever purchased it had to pay uh, the tax on this uh, non-beverage uh, alcohol, 190 proof alcohol. Now this is an interesting import uh, imported distilled spirits. It's from 1921, and uh, it's for it's for perfume being imported from France, and because it had an alcoholic content, uh, it was subject to the tax on distilled spirits. 
<coughs> and finally, uh, uh, I've got some lock seals here. These were from the, uh, the Prohibition Bureau from post-1926, somewhere between 1926 and about 1930. Uh, these were used to cover uh, the keyhole in a lock. They were inside, and these were placed on bonded warehouses, so no, so the proprietor could not sneak in and take out untaxed alcohol from the bonded warehouse. Uh, usually, when I present this, uh, if, if every time they, in order for a proprietor to get into the bonded warehouse the storekeeper gauger from the government had to unlock the warehouse. I suspect there was a second lock that the proprietor put on because I suspect if the government didn't uh, trust the proprietor of the bonded warehouse, the proprietor probably didn't trust uh, the internal revenue agents that they might go in on their own and steal some of their alcohol. <coughs> These, of course, were unused. We've got a plate number at the top. You can tell that this was rescued by a, uh, a stamp collector, probably uh, uh, somebody who worked for Internal Revenue who didn't use all of these and uh, decided to take them home and put them in his collection, and they've come down to us today. Uh, that's the conclusion of my presentation. I would be glad to answer any questions that anybody might have. Uh, you might see in the back, in my, behind me is a state of Delaware beer stamp from the 3.2 period. Uh, this was used in May to the beginning of, uh, sometime in June. They were only in use for about a month. Um, the, the liquor commissioner was one Pierre Dupont. Not a surprise that there is a Dupont uh, this, uh, this, this person was, by the way, previously um, the uh, chairman of the board of uh, General Motors. He had resigned. His residence, by the way, was in Pennsylvania, Longwood Gardens. And there's a wonderful story uh, uh, that I found in a book purchased at Longwood Gardens. One day, uh, as he was working in Delaware and headed home, his driver was driving him back to Longwood Gardens. There was a car in front of them. And whenever they came to an inter intersection where they were going to turn, this car in front of them turned also the same way they were going. And when they got to Longwood Gardens, the car pulled into his residence. And when they pulled up in front of the house, the men jumped out of the car, raised their hands because they thought they were being followed by internal revenue agents. And yes, they did have a trunk full of alcohol, which was purchased by Mr. Pierre DuPont. Any questions you may have? Let's hear it for Ron and then we'll go to Q&A. Just absolutely a fantastic presentation. Thank you, thank you, Ron. Maybe I'll leave with a question. On your earliest stamps you showed, the, the malt, Tax Home Brewers, the New York State, the uh, Malt State of Michigan, the Pear. Who who printed? Who engraved and printed those? Um, were those kind of homemade within the state from local printer? Were those government print? I'm just curious from that as well. I'm looking at the quality of those, I'm just trying to understand who printed those. Yeah, the field the field of uh, state revenues is is bigger than than the federal revenues. Uh, uh, I believe that neither of those were engra from engraved plates and almost certainly would have been a contractor uh, okay. uh, that was printing them for the state itself. Mm -hmm. And then what's the difference? Because the on the Michigan, the one you showed too, the green, the 230 centers, one, the second one below has a B. Yep. If that's the difference there underneath malt tax. And uh, is I that something separate? Or no, it's a year later, they decided to change the design. And uh, the significance of the B, I have no clue. Okay. I have no clue what, I mean, they obviously are different. And so they well, get a different catalog number. That's right. You gotta collect them. And there's a whole set of stamps that look like those $10 ones that uh, match the, uh, 
Uh, they, they are in different formats that obviously for it was probably for over a bottle that uh, that wide stamp. Uh, mm -hmm. And that would have been liquid wort rather than uh, uh, malt itself. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a, a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, thank you for a lovely presentation. But uh, when I was living in England, uh, uh, after we had been living there for three years, we decided to buy a house there. And uh, I, had, I was not familiar with the, uh, what was involved in buying a house in Britain. And when I applied for a mortgage there, I uh, had to uh, get a, uh, an examination by a doctor chosen by the insurance company that would insure the mortgage. And uh, I went and met the doctor at his home. He was retired from uh, full active practice, but he was still uh, doing examinations for insurance companies. And when I went there, uh, one of the questions he asked me was, uh, uh, how much do you drink? And I told him at, at that time, we probably had a, had a you know, glass or two of wine at dinner uh, some nights of the week, and then uh, possibly uh, some cocktails on the weekend. And he looked at me and he said, you know, that really isn't enough. So <laughs> the... Uh, I, I think there are physicians who do believe that uh, alcohol does have medicinal purposes. Uh, he told me that he usually had about uh, two or three double scotch, scotch whiskeys each night. And uh, he was in perfect health and uh, really suggested that I increase my uh, consumption of alcohol. So I, you know, some of these doctors may have been prescribing it for genuine reasons in the belief that uh, this would help their patient. I'll, I'll leave that to you to decide, but that I, I thought, you know, that uh, somebody, some might find that interesting that uh, uh, there are doctors still around that do recommend higher consumption of alcohol. Charlie could tell us about some of those uh, medicinal products that were subject to the uh... Uh, the private dye proprietary stamps, uh, 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 Hostetter's Celebrated Stomach Bitters was uh, 90 proof. It was sold to the uh, Union Army during the Civil War in order to uh, uh, get the soldiers to relax in the evening. So, uh, Correct. Relaxation. Uh, it's all relaxation. about relaxation. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's a great story, Bob. No, you had another question though, Bob, please. Uh, just a comment. Yeah. I'm wondering if we should be start beginning to look for marijuana stamps now, since uh, uh, I remember my dad had a marijuana stamp uh, in his office. And uh, now with all the different states uh, uh, legalizing marijuana, I wonder if there are uh, tax stamps on those mar on marijuana sales, and should we be looking at those as a future area of collect collecting? For the most part, the states are not using marijuana stamps. Now, they, they uh, Arizona was the first that issued those stamps. They no longer use them. This was back in, in, in the last century. Uh, starting in, I believe, in the 1980s. Uh, uh, one of our uh, well-known uh, revenue uh, stamp collectors and a uh, accredited national level judge, Rob Hennick of Milwaukee, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he's a lawyer and, and he got the Wisconsin law, which had used stamps, struck down in the courts. Uh, most of those state laws prior to recent years, um, uh, most of those laws were struck down in one way or the other. There is, there is quite a collection of them. Uh, Illinois, uh, uh, Colorado, uh, Arizona. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other states. Tennessee certainly used them. Uh, but uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, none of those, Rhode Island used them, none of, none of those. Uh, uh, you can purchase them uh, uh, on eBay. Uh, uh, the State Revenue Society has uh, acquired some of them, but all of those are obsolete. Now, if you want 
current marijuana stamps, you'll have to look to Canada. And, and they, uh, I've been trying to get one from each of the, their, their, each province has their name on them. And, and I've got about seven different, the, the remaining ones, even, even some places like Manitoba, I have never seen one offered on eBay. Uh, uh, Newfoundland, I have never seen, uh, uh, and so on. The, 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 some of them are, are, are fairly common. But uh, Saskatchewan and Mano, uh, Manitoba, you would think would would be relatively easy to pick up, but nobody has has yet acquired any and, and listed them on eBay. Right. Uh, you, by the way, you can find uh, if you want if you're interested in U.S. marijuana stamps, they were only in use from about 1937 till uh, 19 the early 1970s. Uh, uh, they are almost unknown used. I know of one uh, one dollar stamp used. The other denominations are only used from the dispersal of of, ex, of, of the stamps from the the postal museum. Uh, and uh, uh, one or two people gathered up all of them, and they tend to be pricey, uh, a couple hundred dollars a piece. Uh, for, for every one of them, uh, and sometimes a little bit more than, than that. Uh, but uh, uh, find them on a document. Uh, I, I, there was one on the cover of the American Philatelist back in the 1990s. Uh, the person that owned that has now died. I have no idea what happened to that document. And that's the only one in document. And from, what, from the best of my knowledge, there's only one $1 used. The rest are unused. Rob, Good questions. Good questions. Um, you mentioned, I think it was Widmer's Pharmacy that the Widmer's, last... Widmer's uh, uh, Wine Cellars. Yeah, they were the, you're right. They're the last ones. Uh, the, the last relative was the one who wanted all the documents destroyed. Yep. When, when, when was that? Do you remember? Uh, I, I believe in the uh, in the 1970s or 80s, okay. okay. Uh, the 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 Widmer's wine cellars. I I I went up to Ropex a couple of years ago, and and uh, surprise surprise, I did a little detour uh, to uh, uh, to make sure that I got to Widmer's. Uh, Widmer's after her death um, went through. It, it kept being purchased by different companies, and and some not direct relatives, but some relatives of the Widmer family have reacquired it. And it is back under the name of Widmer. Mm -hmm. Now, the other interesting thing about them, I, I, uh, I was introduced to a dessert consisting of pears, camembert cheese, and Widmer's Lake Niagara wine, a sweet white wine for dessert. I was, that was, a college classmate of mine introduced uh, me to that when I lived out in the Pittsburgh area. And, and Widmer's Lake Niagara disappeared. I didn't know why it disappeared from the stores, but obviously the company, the, the vineyard had been gone under different names and they are back producing that. And the grapes themselves from which they make that particular wine have asparagus growing along with the grapes. And that is a contributing factor to the taste of this wine. Uh, it's, uh, they don't, they, it isn't under the name of Widmer, but uh, it's, it's under a, a new name, something cat. Uh, I'll, I'll try and get that for you and, 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 and let you know after after Very this meeting. Thank you. Hey Ron, a question on your moonshiners. I mean, clearly these are pretty, you know, there was a lot of them out there, right? And they were trying to peddle their wares and creating yeah. these labels and these, these various tax stamps. And, and the Melvale was one that you talked about with the, yep. even the changing of the name. And, you know, the stamp had the two L's, the label had the one L, but I did notice on the bottom of that label that that red hand stamp, I guess it said bo bottled in bond. The Melvale that was there had two L's too. So even on it, <laughs> they had two different spellings on it, actually on the, on the label itself. 
Yeah. So any rhyme or reason to that? Are they trying to just take take people uh, down? I think, it was, I, I think it was a, a poor example, a, a bad example of uh, proofreading uh, yeah. design. They, they went go. to the cheapest printer they could find Got to it. produce them. <laughs> All right. I'm just saying they, they really messed that one up across the board. I presume, though, these are out there. Right? There's just a, quite a bit, a pretty broad array of the moonshiners and the, the fake labels, too, right? The forged labels across the board. Is that right? The, I'll tell you one, you know, I'm a storyteller. Yes. I used to work for Eric Jackson at the New York shows. And uh, uh, this was a number of years, quite a number of years ago, more than 20 years ago. And somebody came into his booth on Saturday and had stacks of label of, of the, of the prohibition bottle labels, the, the, the wide ones. And they were, they were sort of in a, in a wax paper and big stacks of them and, and, and three, different, uh, three different types of whiskey. Um, Eric was busy with another customer, so I got to look at them first. And the first thing I did, of course, was to hold them up to the light. No watermark. <laughs> so, of course, I looked to Eric and, and, and at that time, by the way, the counterfeit green strip stamps from Prohibition would bring $20, $30 a piece. They were not common. Well, Eric, Eric acquired all of these and those three, um, and Eric asked him if he had any more. And, and the guy said, yeah, I do have a few more. I'll bring them in tomorrow. So Sunday brought the rest of them in, Eric bought them. So Eric asked him, where'd you find these? Oh, well, we were demolishing a build, building over in Hoboken and we found them in the wall. So we, we know that that was quite an operation and they were producing uh, imitations of multiple kinds of whiskey. Uh, and I call those moonshiners as opposed to the bootleggers who are the guys who are smuggling it in sure. for fraud. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's a great find. It's a great <laughs> story, Ron. Thank you for sharing. Any other questions for Ron, please? Just a fascinating topic and subject. If you have not dove in, you know, Ron will definitely help you get more, even more acclimated to this fascinating topic. Pick your favorite state or city, right? Or county. And you could find someone that was producing some sort of bathtub, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I like my gin, so I'm very, I lean towards gin. <laughs> so that's for uh, sure. Growing, growing up, in Ephrata, I remember my father telling me the story. There's a, 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 a ridge that separates, I believe, Lancaster County from Chester County that is known as the Welsh Mountains. And my father used to tell the story that, yeah, he remembers the story when the revenue agents went down there to find the stills that were up there in the Welsh Mountains, and they were never heard from again. <laughs> They're still looking, Ron. They're, They're still, still looking. looking, right? Sure. Thank you, for Ron. Sure. And that's Beartown Ron. Hill. There it is. Yes, yes Ron. Ron. I, I live near Reading. You mentioned that there were you had three light tavern licenses from Berks County. Are those yep. taverns yep. still in existence? No. Do they have the name? Do you have the name on the tavern? Yeah, but I, I, they're not in front of me, uh, and I, I can't tell you. Uh, uh, I have photographs of the tavern. It was, it looked like a, almost like a house that was along the road and, and, and they opened up the, the first floor as a, as a tavern. But uh, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get the information to Paul and he can share it with you. I'll send it out. Okay, appreciate it. Ron, I have a comment about Welsh Mountain. The ridge that is right on the county line actually has a low-grade uranium ore in it, and there's radon in the well water that comes from there. So I wonder if that got into the distills that they were, they were making the, uh, the hooch. And so you, you would have both the alcohol and you would have radiation. Oh, terrific. Terrific. <laughs> so the mountains were glowing. The mountains were aglow yeah. on certain evenings. Sure. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, question I, for Ron? I have a comment about uh, different spellings. Um, I don't know if you've ever run into um, different spellings for, for Emmaus, which is a town close to, to um, Allentown. 
Yep. Um, sometimes spelled with one M and sometimes spelled with two. In fact, I think the town officially is one M and Emmaus Avenue is two M's. And I recently discovered that uh, it was settled by Germans and the name in German had an M with a line over the top, which in German meant it was doubled. Ah, okay. So the, the double M is more accurate to the German, but most people reading it just took off the, the line over the M. So if you see the two spellings, they're both correct. When I was in graduate school, I lived a block off Emmaus, Emmaus Avenue over in Allentown. Uh -huh. And of course, I remember the people who weren't from the local area who always pronounced it Emmaus. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's like an Argyll or an Argyle. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Other questions for Ron? Questions, please. Hey, another round of applause, Ron. Just, yeah, just yeah. phenomenal, Excellent. phenomenal presentation. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank I, I you. 